Hello, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to you. I'm Nath Portlock. I'll be the moderator and host for the session today. Uh, from all of us here at Uplucid, I'd like to extend again a very warm welcome to you. I'm really looking forward to learning from you, to reflecting on your questions and to sharing this space with such curious and like-minded people. A particularly warm welcome to those of you who joined us two weeks ago for the exploration into lucid dreaming and uh, the applications of that with Robert Wagoner. I hope that you've been active in, in dreamland. There's so much expertise in this room. I think cumulatively, we probably have hundreds, if not thousands of years of collective experience from so many different professional backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. And I know this shared insight will lead to lots of really fruitful conversation and questions from you. So I thought we'd start, given that this is a pixelated encounter, just by saying hello to everyone. Uh, we're going to unmute you. and uh, Perhaps you could say hello in your first language and we can uh, connect on a human level. So I think you're all unmuted now. So hello to everyone. Good to see you. Shalom. Shalom. Hi. Hello. Shalom. Hi. Shalom. Hi. Shalom. Shalom. Marco Rey. Bravo. Shalom. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to remember that there are humans here as well. Um, so the format for today is that I'll say I'll say my part and then I'll hand over to Nia. And Nia's workshop will take around 50 minutes. Uh, we'll then have a short comfort break of five minutes and we'll go into the Q&A. And during the q and it'd be lovely for you to ask your own questions. So you write your question and your full name in the chat and one of the team will come over to uh, invite you up to ask your question. And uh, just remember to use the reaction menu to raise your hand so that we can find you. But we'll go over that in, uh, in a bit after Nir's done his workshop. The scheduled time for the Q&A is 25 minutes. We'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can. And our finish time is set for one hour and 30 minutes from now. So a quick bit about who we are, if you've not come across this before. Well, we're an interdisciplinary platform for educators and therapists, so, so for you, basically. What does that mean? Well, we're trying to connect and empower people, uh, to empower the people who work with people and hopefully make the world a bit better in the progress in the process. Um, we want to build skills and share best practice, and we want to share knowledge and share the often progressive tools that are improving our lives and the lives of the people we work with. But we realize that there's often a bit of a distance, sometimes a huge distance between what happens on the mountain of research and, and what happens down in the field. And it seems to us that often practitioners uh, working day to day are not always that well connected to firstly each other. It, it can be a lonely life, especially if you're freelance. They're not always that well connected to the academic research and vice versa. You know, does cutting edge practice really inform research and does cutting edge research really inform best practice? My background's in education and I, I know that's certainly not the case in education, sadly although it is improving. Um, and also, are we that connected to the wider ideas and methodologies that, that, uh, that we, can, we can share from interdisciplinary practice? You know, there's so much crossover between what you're doing and what all of all the people here are doing, and how can we use that knowledge and fuse that together um, to, to, to let the ideas flow freely between us? So our proposal is a very simple one. We hope that through Uplucid, academic research and personal practice can become better integrated. So we're delighted that all of you could join us uh, for part of that journey today. It's enough from me. So it's time to introduce Nir. Uh, now, Nir Tadmore is a transpersonal psychotherapist in private practice. He holds a master's in transpersonal psychology from Middlesex University. This was gained through the Aleph Trust, who really are blazing a trail in transformative education and training in transpersonal and spiritual psychology. Nir is the co-founder of SafeShore, a psychedelic harm reduction and peer support project focused on providing safe psychological spaces for dance festivals. And he's also extensively trained in Hakomi body-centered psychotherapy. 
Neil, we've actually known each other professionally for some time, and I've been lucky enough to attend some of your training, which was typically warm, pragmatic, and sensitive. Your work is right at the front of what is already a progressive field, and it's lovely to be able to welcome you here today. So we're going to unmute everybody and, and just say hello to Nir. Hello, Nir. It's great, great to have you and great to see your face again. Hi, Nir. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, Nir. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Good to be here. Thank you so much, Nathan. So during the next 50 minutes, I'm going to share with you really basic simple practices that might support us in case uh, where we meet uh, people who are going through a difficult psychedelic experience. Maybe we think that they might be going through a difficult psychedelic experience and we will realize that they're not. But we're going to really start from uh, the moment that you see someone that you assume uh, is having a difficult experience. And we're going to start really from the second that you assume that, and we will go step by step through all the do's and don'ts of psychedelic crisis intervention. I, I will say that everything I'm sharing with you here uh, is based on, uh, first of all, on years of experience. We have been doing this with SafeShore in the field for seven years already, and it's based on a lot of experience. But the structure and the principles of psychedelic harm reduction were laid by the Zendo project, which are uh, a daughter project of, the, of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, who are leading psychedelic research all over the world. So their daughter project, the Zendo project, are also doing psychedelic harm reduction in uh, parties and festivals in the US. So they laid uh, a training manual, which we took a lot out of, and I'm going to share what I'm going to share on the basis of the four principles of harm reduction that the Zendo project laid out. So we are going to start with the first and of course the most important aspect, which is creating a safe space. This is the first principle and we're going to spend, I guess, most of the workshop today around this principle. So we are, uh, we might encounter someone during a party or a festival. We might encounter someone uh, during a, a gathering somewhere more homey at a friend's place, in our place. I've been, again, I've been getting quite a lot of phone calls recently of people accidentally consuming large doses of psychedelics from uh, the refrigerator of their friends. Um, so this is something that is happening more and more, unfortunately, with people not protecting, I would say, the substances in a really safe place. And this way, many people are, it's, it's much more common than you would think, honestly. So this kind of situation might happen any day, any time. So it's not necessarily parties or festivals, but uh, I, I, I am bringing most of my experience from this environment. So when we see someone going through a difficult experience and we want to approach him, so first of all, we need to present ourselves. And this is a very important part. Uh, whether we are volunteering in a psychedelic harm reduction project or we're just approaching someone we don't know in the street, it's really important to come with an eye level approach. Yeah, this is not someone who is, um, has a, it's really important to keep an eye level approach, to be very gentle, to present yourself with first name, even if you are a doctor, even if you're a psychologist, you're not coming to this per person as a professional at the moment, it's just human to human connection and human to human compassion and empathy that we want to bring in. It's not about hierarchy and uh, being a professional. So we're presenting ourselves in the first name, in the eye level. And the eye level is something I mean literally. Sometimes we see someone, especially in parties and festivals, people are lying down on the ground. People might sit down on the ground and hold their head down because they're just overwhelmed with the amount of, uh, um, um, yeah, amount of information, the amount of visual, sonic, 
all the sounds, all the visuals, all the people, all the lights, it can be overwhelming. So when I'm saying eye level, I mean, as, uh, in the context of the approach, but also physically, sometimes when people are lying on the ground, I actually kind of lie down next to them. Yeah, and this is already when someone is lying down on the ground and someone is coming and really looking to him in the eye level, it's without saying anything, it's already very obvious that you're coming towards him, that you're there for him. Yeah, usually a, a doctor, a police officer, a security guard, they will stand above the person and talk to him. Yeah. So as soon as we're going down to the ground, whether it's sitting or half lying down, it's already telling the person, which might be in a situation where it's really, really difficult to communicate in words and maybe even understand what you're saying, it's already bringing a lot of your approach without saying anything. The next stage is that we want to quickly assess our guests, we usually call them guests because I work in the context of having a safe space. So the people arriving are guests and we are their sitters. Uh, so that's a little bit about the terminology. Um, so when I am approaching someone, I want to quickly assess if he's in any medical uh, condition, any danger physically. Now, I am not a doctor. I guess most of you are not, are not doctors. And Usually, if we have the slightest doubt, we turn to medical professionals and they might not be very accessible. As Safe Shore, we go only to parties where there's an ambulance and medical team, so we won't have to deal with something that is out of our profession. Um, so it's really important if you think that the person might be suffering um, from an overdose, might be dehydrated, might uh, be in, in pain because he broke something. If there's any medical condition, it's extremely important to first of all, take care of the medical condition. And if you're not sure, it's good to first of all, turn to a paramedic, to a medical professional. And only once you get the approval, we can continue supporting someone emotionally. Uh, and that's, that's a very important part. There have been cases in the past where people uh, supported someone over hours and hours uh, without realizing he's dehydrated and, and some people even lost their lives uh, this way. So if you have any doubt whatsoever, consult a professional. Um, set and setting. So basically I would say that set and setting in a sense is uh, an umbrella title for everything I'm going to say today and maybe for the whole psychedelic harm reduction field. So set and setting is a very central term in the world of psychedelics. And set refers to mindset. Yeah, this is the personality of the person, his mood at the time, how he slept the night before. Um, maybe he has some uh, medical um, mental condition. Um, all the different aspects of the internal environment of the person are the set. Okay, and setting are the totality of the environmental surroundings. So this means if I'm in daylight or night, if I'm in a club or a outdoor festival, if I'm with friends or alone, if I'm with friends, do I really trust them or not? Yeah, and there's even another layer to the setting where which uh, Dr. Ido Hartogzon from here in Israel, he calls cultural set and setting. And this is another very important aspect, which unfortunately I won't have enough time to go into today. But for example, just so you get the, the idea, in Israel, many of the people, most of the people have been to the army. And many of the young men that we meet in parties and festivals have been through different combat situations. And we meet a lot of PTSD um in these parties and festivals so this is a part of the israeli cultural set and setting yeah somewhere else in the world you might not meet that much ptsd so that's another important aspect um there's a, a point which is very important and if our presence is not welcomed by the person we're approaching it's very important that we respect that Okay, and sometimes we even have cases where 
uh, I turn to someone and he doesn't look too well um, and he asks me to back away. So I will think, why is that? Maybe I came too quickly. Maybe I came in a somewhat aggressive vibe because I was worried and anxious. Maybe this woman wants a woman to approach her and not a man. We're very, very sensitive to this, these things. And when we work in parties and festivals, we always walk in pairs of male and female. So we can always approach um, in a more balanced and uh, yeah, gen generally appropriate way, I, I would say. Um, so we, we don't force our presence and our will to help on someone. We will think who is the best person to intervene in this situation. Many times, and this is a very important point, many times we guide the friends and family of the person who is going through a crisis so that they know how to approach him. Um, a few weeks ago, I had a 15 minute conversation with a mother that her son was on the way home while he is very much tripping on a few grams of psilocybin mushrooms. And he got really, really scared and anxious. His friends didn't know what to do. He wanted to go home and they called me on the way home. So I had about 15 minutes to prepare his mom that knows absolutely nothing about psychedelics to what is going to happen and what she needs to take care of and what she uh, shouldn't be worried about. And these 15 minutes proved to be extremely, extremely important. And she, she, she deeply thanked me a, a day after realizing how much valuable information I could give her and how much stress I took out of her. Just, I, I will give one example from it because we are limited in time, but I guaranteed her that psilocybin mushrooms will not cause any neurological damage. This is not something people know. This is not common knowledge. But this is an absolute fact that psilocybin mushroom do not cause neurological damage. They can maybe be a trigger to a psychotic breakdown in the very, very extreme case of like someone who had the tendency to uh, have a psychotic breakdown, someone who was in a really bad set and setting, someone who uh, took mushrooms during a mental crisis in his life. Okay, but there will not be any neurological damage. And here it's also very important to know the different substances. It's a part of our responsibility as SafeShore to know the substances, to know how long each substance should have an impact. Okay, and I, I will get more into it uh, soon. But knowing the substances, knowing the dangers, knowing the risks, knowing different risks of different contraindications as far as combining two different substances, which is happening a lot in parties and festivals. All of this is re really valuable knowledge. So a few important questions that we want to bring in when we approach someone that we don't know, and we have no idea what happened before we saw him. We, a few important questions we want to bring in, and this is not an intake. I do not mean that you're going to ask these questions one after another. I mean that these are important aspects to take into consideration. So first of all is what do you need? Yeah, we do not assume that we know what this person needs. We want to hear the person and we, we want to ask him. We want to bring uh, him the opportunity to say what is it that he needs and we will do everything we can to respect that. Of course, that if he will say he needs more of any any substance, of course, we will not comply, but it's very important to start with what is it that you need? How can I help? Okay. Another important question is, can you describe what happened before? And some people will start describing for two hours what just happened before. And some people will not be able to explain, but their friends will be able to answer. We want to know what brought this person to the situation he is in at the moment, so we can know how to how to deal with it the best in the best way. Uh, did you take any psychoactive substance? Did you take any psychedelic? Um, this is a very um, legit question, I would say, in this situation. And if the person does not want to respond or to answer, of course, it is his right. We do not want to push someone. He doesn't have to share with us what he took. 
but of course it will be best if we know what he took so we know what are the risks how many hours are expected where is he in the in the timeline of the experience uh, for example one of the experiences that i had that actually led me to to found to to be a founder of of a psychedelic harm reduction project was that i met in a party a 17 year old girl that took uh, two doses of lsd on the first time she ever took lsd she took two doses of lsd with people she don't know on the way to a party and i met her uh, in the parking lot of the party completely scared uh, one hour into the experience so of course it was more important to to spend time with her rather than going to to the party uh, i was not alone also which was great but it eventually we realized that the best thing will be to tell her that this is going to get stronger we're going to stay with you you're going to be safe but the experience is going to be stronger it's not going to be off in 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 in, in an hour or two yeah she, she took two doses she it will be the minimum for eight hours okay so we could tell her that this is going to last for a while because eight hours does, don't mean anything at that moment. And we also do not promise any specific time frame because then if after 10 hours, she will still be under the influence, she will feel, oh, I, I'm going crazy. I went crazy, I'm stuck here. And no, LSD can have an effect of up to 16 hours. So we're not promising anything, but I told her that this is going to get stronger. And when it did get stronger, she was actually happy that I could give her a, a map yeah, very basic map, but she felt there is someone here that knows what I'm going through. So I'm in good hands. So that's an, another important point that we might be able to communicate clearly what roughly uh, can happen or might happen and that this is okay. This is a part of the normal LSD experience and you, you'll, you'll be okay. Has anything similar happened to you in the past? This is very important as well. Many times people are going through similar experiences a week after week. And when we ask, has anything similar happened in the past? They reply very quickly that it happened two weeks ago and exactly what helped them, yeah? So sometimes people just need someone with them to help them execute a plan that they are praying that someone will just help them execute. Maybe we had one woman that just couldn't find a safe space to uh, go to the loo in a festival. And then two of our sitters just helped her have a safe private space to go to the loo. And she felt much, much, much better. So sometimes we offer extremely basic, simple assistance, but for the person who is in a completely non-ordinary state of consciousness, it can be, yeah, a, a feeling like he was saved, a feeling that, uh, yeah, someone was, for him, with him and for him in his crisis, which is a big thing. Do you take any medicine or psychiatric medicine? This is a very sensitive uh, question, of course, but we want to bring it in at some point, especially when someone seems to be having a very, sorry, a very intense experience. Um, so many times people don't feel comfortable answering it. And many times people do feel comfortable answering it. But in case that there are psychiatric medications involved, we want to take into consideration uh, that it might, the best option might be to consult with the psychiatrist, at least to let the psychiatrist know. Uh, it might be a good idea to let the paramedic or the medical team of the festival to know this if we are escorting the person to the medical team. But this is very important. Uh, information and also there is a of course I guess most of you know SSRIs which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors which are the most common antidepressive uh, medication there is and many people fear combining SSRI and the uh, psychedelics which is of course not recommended in any way but in some situ situations it might be even riskier to quit medications that you have been taking for two years now, a one week before the festival without consulting with your psychiatrist and then taking a psychedelic. This might be 
even riskier. And of course, I'm not a doctor, I'm not giving any medical advice here, but it's important to remember this, that stopping psychiatric medications without professional support because you want to take psychedelics might be a very bad idea. So another important uh, point. Um, confidentiality, I will not say a lot about, um, but I think it's clear. We support someone, he trusts us with the most intimate, sensitive moments and information of his life. And even though we're not working any, under, un, under any um, association or supervision and we're approaching just as one person to another, we, com we, we keep all the information the person shared with us completely confidential. This is, of course, very, very, very important. Um, physical contact, that's another very sensitive and extremely important um, subject. So first of all, we want to get clear consent for any type of physical touch. And the most advanced physical touch I'm talking about is touching someone's shoulder, holding someone's hand, yeah? Uh, if maybe it's man to man, woman to woman, maybe a hug will be appropriate depending on the situation and what's going on and how this hug actually looks like. Is it a half minute hug that we both breathe together? I guess not. If it's a quick hug to calm someone down because he, he's crying or he just had a horrible experience, maybe it's appropriate if he consent, if, if there is a clear consent and if we feel that this is the right thing to do. So we want to use our judgment, no matter what happens, we are not getting into any intimate contact. We're not touching the belly. We're not, I mean, sexual contact, of course, will be completely, completely unethical and horrible in, in such a situation. I, I hope this is clear, uh, but we're not getting intimate as far as touch. Even if we hold hands, we don't let the holding hands become I don't even know how to say it in English, but the fingers patting each other, we're not becoming intimate in that sense. We might hold someone's hand as a sign of support, sign of I'm here with you, I see you, I'm not going anywhere. And even for this, we're going to ask, is it okay if I will hold your hand? Is it okay if I will put my hand on your shoulder? We're not assuming that any sort of touch is okay, not in general, and especially not during a psychedelic crisis. Um, Another thing I want to mention, and this is a tricky one, is that many times a, a simple massage on the shoulders can do a lot to relieve stress, a lot, a lot. And I've seen this happening, especially with MDMA, that people are, are all tense, very anxious, all tense, and a woman to woman and the men to men, sometimes we find it's great that there will be a simple shoulder massage. It helps ground, it helps relieve tension, and uh, it helps to feel that you're just getting uh, human compassionate support from someone that sees your, your stress. Now, this is a tricky one because first of all, from my volunteers, I do not expect that all of my volunteers will be comfortable in providing such a massage. So if you are a body worker, if you are comfortable with it as a sitter, it might be okay if there is consent, if we see that this is helping and if the person uh, actually needs it. And here we're getting into another tricky territory. And of course, all of this field, all of the psychedelic harm reduction crisis intervention field is, is, is a tricky, gray area situation. But we want to be extremely, extremely careful if people have a freeze response, yeah? I guess most of you know the freeze, fight and flight response, yeah, the FFF. So if someone is getting into an existential stress, into a survival mode, yeah, he might fight, which of course will be a clear sign that he's uh, scared. He might, a freeze, which I will say more about in a second, and he might fly, he might run away, okay? So when someone is running away and someone trying to hit you, this is very clear, you cannot miss this, okay? Obviously the person is in survival mode and will have to deal with it. And I will talk about violence in a second. 
But when someone freezes, this is much easier to, to, to miss. And when you're giving someone even the most basic shoulder massage to relieve stress, sometimes people freeze. They're in a non-ordinary state. They might have completely forgot that they're in a safe psychedelic harm reduction tent, that the person touching them is a woman that asked for consent and they gave it. Yeah, so we want to be extremely careful. And when someone is freezing, we immediately break the contact, we create eye contact, and we get the person back to presence with us. We explain the situation and we do not go back into this uh, touch whatsoever. So this is extremely important because someone might say, yes, of course, I'm really tense. I want a massage. And five minutes later, he will be in a completely different place in his consciousness and he will not be able to actually respond. He or she, of course, will not be able to respond uh, and freeze and go into uh, a, an experience that can be very, very traumatic. So we want to kind of check in every 30 seconds, one minute. Hey, is this still okay with you? It, it, it can be even if it's not about the massage. It can be even if it's holding hands. It can be many different things. We want to check in once in a while to see that what we agreed on a few minutes ago is still valid. Now, violence. So in any case of physical violence, we break uh, contact. We're not there to save the world. We're not there to save the person no matter what. We're not there to get punches in the face. And in case someone is violent towards us, of course, we shouldn't take it personally because it's not. But then we want to understand what is the best way to prevent harm. Okay, so if I'm in a party or festival, I am, I might contact the security guards, which can hold him. And once a violent person is being held by a security guard, I can go back into trying to calm him down, to communicate, to mediate. If we're not in a party, and there are no security guards, in some extreme cases, the right thing to do might be to call the police. It might be. Of course, it, situations where you call in the police can even become worse, as we know. But if someone is violent towards himself or to others, we should think what would be the best and quickest way to prevent this person from harming himself or others. And we shouldn't put ourselves in the middle just because we're the ones that noticed his distress from uh, like we were the ones to first re um, recognize his distress so what i tell my volunteers and what i tell you is that the most important thing is that you will take care of yourself and in my guidebook that i give to to our volunteers in the training that's the only sentence that is marked in yellow do not offer any kind of support when you feel that you yourself do not have the right support to offer this support. First of all, take care of yourself. We cannot, and this was learned the hard way, I would say, this, we cannot offer any good grounding support when we ourselves are not grounded and feeling safe. And if I am stressed, if I'm afraid that this person is going to punch me in the face any moment, I am not the right person to support him on my own, at least. Okay, so we want to be very conscious of how our body feels. Am I anxious now? Am I not? How is my breath? Am I breathing deeply? Am I comfortable? And I will even say that when people are in a non-ordinary state, they're much much more sensitive to things that we do not notice on our day-to-day -day ordinary state of consciousness. And many times the, when friends are anxious or worried about one of their friends, this friend who is now tripping experience them as, as hostile, as scared, sometimes even as violent and aggressive because they're not with him. They're scared. Yeah, I hope this is this is clear, I can't really see your faces, but I, when, when we are worried about someone, in a sense, we're separated from him. We're already not together in the experience. 
in, in a sense, of course, there's many situations where we should be worried about someone and it's good that we're worried, but the actual emotional state that we are in is resonating to the other person. And if we're worried, anxious, think within ourselves that this person is crazy and now we lost him and he will be stuck like this forever, I promise you, you're not the right person to help. Okay. Um, so, yes, this was quite long and I will go to the next principle of harm reduction, which is sitting, not guiding. Until now, everything we said is under the principle of creating a safe space. And now we're going to talk briefly about sitting instead of guiding. So the essence of the sitting is a loving presence, full of compassion, acceptance and caring, empathic listening, trust building, and letting our guests experience lead the way. This is again, extremely important. And doesn't matter how many psychedelic experiences we had where we had a terrible moment and then our partner came and showed us a flower which made our experience amazing. This is not going in accordance to the ethics of psychedelic crisis intervention whatsoever. We want to respect the experience that the person is going through and allow it to unfold. We, don't, we do not try to guide the experience to somewhere that we feel is the right thing to experience or the most safe thing to experience. Whatever is coming out of the person naturally, we take into consideration that it might be, there might be a very good reason why he experiences it, why these specific contents memories from his unconscious are surfacing now. We want to respect that and allow the experience to run its full course. And this is not easy because when someone is sitting and crying and sharing with us his very painful story, it might be a very difficult, painful thing to, to, to hold, to contain, to support. And again, we're not alone there. We work as a team. So sometimes we have each other to support, which is extremely important. To be alone in supporting a severe psychedelic crisis can be a very, very, very painful, difficult experience. Um, so it's best if you do not provide such support on your own. But we want to allow even the most painful, difficult emotions to come up, whether it's grief, uh, will to revenge, uh, sadness, depression, suicidal thoughts, whatever it is that is coming up, we want to respect that and let it unfold. Okay. I do not mean to let people execute their suicidal thoughts at the moment, naturally, but to allow them to express what they're feeling and thinking at the moment without us wanting to divert their experience to a more positive experience okay this is a tricky one it sounds it might sound natural and clear and simple but it is not uh, and of course if someone is suffering for a long time of course i can try and think how can i make this better for him how can i support him yes sometimes we offer tea or a blanket or a safe space to rest in the shade which in israel we don't have much of so these simple things can be huge in, in transforming the experience from a painful, challenging, scary one to a safe and, 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 and beautiful one. Uh, but we want to make sure that we do whatever we do because it serves the person best and not serves our pain that arose from his pain. We do not try to change his process so that we will feel better for ourselves. If we feel we're not the right people to support, we better think who might be a better person to provide support. There's many things I want to share with you and we won't have the time to go through all the little details. I regularly hold two day workshops where we go into all the do's and don'ts because there are a lot. But I want to say very generally that even if we are therapists, we are going to leave our therapist hat outside the door of the psychedelic harm reduction tent. We, when a person is in, in, in a non-ordinary state, he did not choose us as a therapist. He especially did not choose us for a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy process. And we do not have any uh, therapeutic alliance with the person. So 
we are his sitters, we're not his therapists. So if someone is sharing with me a very painful traumatic experience that he is confronting for the first time in his life, he has something from 25 years ago. He never remembered this, yeah? Me as a therapist, I would say it will be a challenging situation not to do therapeutic work with this person. We have like an opportunity, so-called, to do a therapeutic process, but this will be wrong. This is unethical because we do not have a therapeutic alliance. We're not in a safe enough environment to be in a psychotherapeutic process. And the person might not have enough support after he shares with me the the... Of course, it's good that he is sharing the experience, but if I will engage in deeper therapeutic work with him and I will not be able to continue this process with him, which again will be unethical, this might be re-traumatizing, okay? So even if someone is sharing with me a very painful traumatic experience, I allow him to share it with me. I do not dive deeper. I don't get him to dive deeper. I don't use the tools I use in my clinic as a transpersonal psychotherapist. I don't bring these tools in because this is not the situation. Our mission is to reduce harm. Okay. We are preventing harm from happening. We make sure that the person gets to 8, 16, 24 hours from now in a good medical condition hopefully a very good mental emotional condition as well although it's not our responsibility to make sure that he solves all of his life traumas and that the experience that rose to the surface was now treated um, in a therapeutic context okay so we allow people to share we allow them to share their experience we do not engage in psychotherapeutic work and th this is very important we want to acknowledge the experience of the person, but we do not want to lie in any way. And I will explain. If someone is telling me, I'm, I'm seeing all these scary dragons on, on, the, on the cover of the tent, yeah, I am not going to tell him, oh yeah, I see these dragons too, just to make him feel better. Yes, and, and, and some people I've seen them doing that. They lie to the people so that the people will not think that they're crazy, which of course is, is, is wrong. We want to acknowledge your experience. I, I understand that you see these dragons. I am happy to hear more about them if you want to share with me. I have to tell you, I don't see them. Of course, if, if I'm being asked, yeah, it's not that everything I'm being shared, I'm saying, oh, I don't experience that, I'm not seeing that. But many times people ask us, do you see that? Do you feel that? Did you notice that? And I'm saying the truth, which I think is another, it sounds simple, but it's not. So stick to the truth, say the truth, and it, it, it will be fine. Um, it's, it's important because trust is, is everything we have at that moment. And if the person will feel that we lied to him, we just lost the connection with the person. And now it will be much, much harder to create another trustful uh, intervention. Um, I think in our time frame, this will be it. Um, the next principle is talk through, not down, okay? Which is very related to what I said before. We help our guests to connect to what they are feeling at the moment without distracting them from the experience. We invite guests to observe and explore their inner world without resisting the experience. As sitters, we avoid sharing our personal beliefs, that's an important one, and values and value systems with our guests in consideration of their delicate state. I will say it again, the, the second part. As sitters, we avoid sharing our personal beliefs and value systems with our guests in consideration of their delicate state. And an example for it might be that someone has a lot of pain in the belly, okay? A lot of tension and pain and, and pressure in the belly. And as a sitter, I will come and say, you know, I think you have a lot of energy held in your third chakra, okay? When someone is in a non-ordinary state, 
he, when people are in a non-ordinary state, they're very, very suggestible. It's very easy to influence their thought patterns, their beliefs, their emotions. And we don't want to imp implement, to, to plant. We, we don't want to plant ideas, foreign ideas to the person belief system. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything about chakras, anything about God, angels, energies. Yeah, I, I'm not going to bring foreign ideas into the person's language and, and, and understanding of what is going on. What is happening is that she does not have a lot of energy in her third chakra. She feels pressure. Yeah, the energy in the third chakra was, let's say, my idea. Yeah, I brought that in. And that's wrong because this person might stay for years and years in this framework of thinking without her realizing that someone kind of planted it unethically. And another more extreme uh, example for it would be that sometimes um, there are, for example, people who are going through uh, psychedelic crises and they're turning to religious people to provide support for them. And it, it happens in Judaism, it happens in Christianity, it happens with Mormons in Australia, it happens all over the world. And when you turn as uh, someone in crisis to uh, someone who is representing God at the moment, and this person is kind of teaching you yeah, his dogma, his way of seeing the world, and it helps you, uh, it might be a very tricky to situation to get out of. Okay, so this can be, I mean, in very extreme situations, even cults use such uh, approaches. Yeah, getting people into non-ordinary states and then convincing them in different ways that this specific dogma is the truth. And under the influence of psychedelics, it can be much, much easier than you would think to brainwash, simply said, uh, to brainwash people. And our last uh, uh, principle of harm reduction is the most clear one, I would say, is difficult is not the same as bad. And challenging experiences can often become our most significant experiences and can lead to personal growth and development, which I will say a few more sentences about in, in a minute. We keep in mind that there is a good reason why this person is having this experience right now. When doubts and, con when doubts and concerns arise, we encourage a curious point of view. So encouraging a curious point of view is a big thing. We want to stay open. We want to accept. We want to confront the contents that arise eye to eye. As we say, to look to the dragon in the eye, to look to the monster in the eye. Even if fear comes up, if pain comes up, if difficult memories comes up, let's stay with it. We can stay with it and just, just observe it together. And just the fact that we're doing this together is many times very healing. And what I wanted to say about growth and development is that we have the privilege many times in parties and festivals we have the privilege to see people going through truly healing, transformative processes. We do not push them towards it. I don't feel uh, maybe I don't feel I did my job better if people had a transformative experience that has to do with their biology, the substance they took, their emotional state, the certain setting they came from, who they are. It's not about what I provided. Uh, but many times we get to see people going through transformative experiences, arriving to us very scared and leaving the tent very happy and grounded and acknowledging parts of themselves they did not acknowledge before. And I would say that this is a privilege of this work that we get to see uh, transformations happening within ours to such an extreme degree. I, I was working for uh, more than five years in different uh, psychiatric hospitalization alternatives. And where I was always saying at work that doing Safe Shores work is the easy work. Yeah, I, I supported, like we supported as a team, we supported about a thousand people during the last seven years. All of these 
1,000 people are back to their ordinary state maximum three days after the party if it was the most extreme situation, yeah? All of them went back to their ordinary state of consciousness. Out of all the 1,000 people we supported, no one got stuck. No one was left in a psychiatric hospital for years. Everyone went through the experience, whether it was traumatic, difficult, beautiful, it doesn't matter. And in psychiatric centers, sometimes people can stay in a similar, somewhat similar state for years and years and years. So I will say that although there is sometimes this benefits and privilege of seeing someone uh, experiencing growth and fulfillment and the transcendence, this is not the point. This is not our mission as sitters to guide someone towards such experience. So we respect whatever is coming up. We keep a safe space. We do not bring our agendas in and we make sure we take care of ourselves, first of all, during this process. Thank you very, very, very much for listening. Thank you, Nia, thank you. So we're going to take a short comfort break of five minutes to, to mull over so much content there and so much practical advice and uh, ethical consideration. So if you have any questions on anything that Nia has spoken about, you're very, very welcome to, to write your question and your full name into the chat. And we will then read out your name and we invite you to raise your hand. So I'm sure most of you know where that is. It's a little smiley face in the reactions menu. Um, when you raise your hand, that's the only way we can find you. So we'll we'll swim through the digital ether to locate you with that yellow hand. We have a soft time limit of one and a half minutes for each question. Um, if you have any problems, let us know in the chat. And uh, we really look forward to seeing you in five minutes time. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you to those of you who've been writing your names and your question into the chat, uh, as well as getting your hand raised. That's really helpful. Just to reiterate that we really do we would love to see your question and your name as well as your hand um, raised because that will give us all the information we need to find you as fast as possible and to introduce you properly uh, although i'm very happy to read these questions out hi louise how are you doing hello doing good thank you so much for this great talk it was great yeah it's on you were saying that <clears throat> If uh, that the person has been taking antidepressants, that was an important piece of information, but what to do in that case? <clears throat> okay, can you hear me well? Yeah. Great. So first of all, um, I think it's just important to consult with the medical professional that actually prescribed these medications for, for the person. If the situation gets severe, of course, that if someone is just scared and confused, we don't have to call a psychiatrist five minutes later. Yeah, But it, if things are getting worse and we find that the person is, we, we cannot support the person and it's getting worse and worse, we should consider consulting with his psychiatrist. It's still in, in it, yeah, we, we can trust his psychiatrist to keep this information there safe of course and we we it also tells us of course there's a good reason why the person is taking ssri from the first place so it also helps us understand that some of the issues he's dealing with as a part of his psychedelic experiences did not start in the psychedelic experience and will probably not end in the psychedelic experience we under we better understand the mental context of the person in his life okay um, so it helps us understand if this is a situation that is temporary because of the trip, or maybe this we are dealing here with a mental crisis that maybe the psychedelics kind of made more extreme a bit, but it might not be over in eight, 10 hours, okay? And we had quite a, quite a lot of people like that, that we thought it's going to end in eight, 
12 hours. And then we realized that they are diagnosed with bipolar disorder. They have quite a lot uh, manic episode, quite a lot of manic episodes, which last for a few days. And like we can spend more and more and more time and energy and it, this is not going to be solved. So when people are dealing with a mental crisis that is not necessarily related to psychedelics, I think that it's best to find the familiar safe environment as much as this is possible, of course. But we might consider calling their friends that to come and pick them up, to take them home. We might call the family if this is appropriate and we have consent for this. It, we, we will, yeah, each, each situation is quite complex and we deal it with it specifically. But taking psychiatric medications tell us a lot, especially, as I said before, stopping to take psychiatric medications is, is a sign of many things that I just cannot get into at the moment. I, I hope that answers. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Malaika. Um, Malaika, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If you could raise your hand, we'll get, we'll get over to you. Hi, I'm sorry. I don't have um, a webcam. Um, but my question They're overrated, is about... Malaika. <laughs> um, my question's about returning to a normal state of consciousness. And I'd be curious to know um, basically why some people aren't able to go back to a normal state of consciousness. And also as what can we do to support them in being able to go back to a normal state of consciousness and not being stuck? Okay. So I would say that from my experience, as I said, all the people I ever supported went back into an ordinary state of consciousness. Some people, very few of them, but some people had a mental crisis that lasted for a few days. Some of them had to get um, psychiatric medications in extreme situations. It was by injection. But um, when people ex experience a non-ordinary state after the amount of time that the drug was supposed to have an impact for. Um, for example, if I am 48 hours after I took LSD, I'm still experiencing a non-ordinary state. This is not an LSD trip. This is already a non-ordinary state, a mental crisis, a manic episode, a psychotic episode. It doesn't matter the terminology here. It does, it's not really important, but we're dealing with a mental condition that was triggered by the psychedelics but this is not the influence of the psychedelics anymore and then we have to consider who is this person what is his mental condition his personality structure before that experience i mean some people have a psychotic breakdown during a psychedelic experience which changes their life and they 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 uh, they are not back to what they were before. Uh, but I have to say that my experience shows that when people are supported compassionately, professionally, and when people are not being re-traumatized or traumatized during a psychedelic experience, they will go back to an ordinary state of consciousness and they will be fine. But some people just go through psychedelic experiences in very, very, very bad conditions and even abusive surroundings and this can just be traumatizing. And then the non-ordinary state is um, just a mental condition that is not related to psychedelics exactly, I, I would say, even if they made it more extreme or the person was really suggestible and something that wouldn't be so traumatic without the psychedelics did become a very traumatic experience. This can definitely happen. But if someone is not going back to into a non-ordinary state, if a person is not going back to an ordinary state of consciousness, we are probably just dealing with an emergence of, of something we can call a, a mental disorder or just a prolonged crisis that it will take more time to deal with. Uh, but my experience shows that it's extremely, extremely rare. I hope that answers. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank you to those of you who are putting your name in the chat and raising your hands. There's another one here from RMV. RMV, I think if you've got your hand up, we'll, we'll find you and invite you up to ask your question to Nia. Hi, Nia. 
it's so nice to have people coming up and hi nice and hi how are hi. you nice to, nice to see you hi and nice you have a question for you uh, from me, yeah. I don't know if you hear me well. Um, I hear you well. I asked it on the chat already. So, uh, if I'm in EMDR therapy, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, EMDR, so, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, restructuring memories, mainly emotional memories. And I know that uh, trips could have the same effect, but I'm not sure if they interfere with one another i would like to try but i'm not sure if it's advisable i i don't know much about emdr to be honest uh, but i would say that it's probably best to consult with um, someone that knows both uh, both worlds um, and i would say that um yeah, it's just really hard for to to answer it. I think it depends on many many factors that I just can't can't really take into consideration. So I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not. I, I don't think I have a really good answer uh, for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, RMV. Um, I think sometimes it is a question of variables, and without a deeper knowledge of of um, where you are, it might be difficult to answer that. But thank you for asking that question. It's so great that that uh, people are coming up and we can see you. You must be bored of seeing my face by now. So um, we've got another one here from um, Olvi, Olivi. Um, uh, they've written in. Um, yes, so it's a question about sitting, a, an ethical question. So Olivi, Olivia, sorry, Olivia. <laughs> I'm reading the typos out loud here. Um, <laughs> Olivia, I think you've got a question. Okay, thank you. Sorry, uh, I can't use my video either. Um, but thank you so much for this. I'm in uh, New York City. Um, I have I have a question um, about sitting with someone. Um, and often people actually have drugs on them still. So how do you navigate um, the situation where perhaps, you know, people are like make it go away, make it go away, maybe I'll smoke a joint, you know, I'll take another drug to try and offset, you know, these kind of uh, things that people think are gonna are gonna take this experience away um so that was one and then this is super cheeky so only if there's time but is it ethical uh to give your contact information to someone because that's happened to me before when i've sat that somebody's wanted to stay connected thank you so much this is amazing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you for the questions i will start with the second question uh, i think it's definitely ethical to 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 give the contact information you're not promising anything you're not giving this person a contact so you, um, you will be his therapist now. You, you don't promise anything, but I think it's great to give someone your, your contact so he can contact you. And then you might be in a situation where you helped someone so much that he feels you're, uh, you're his best friend. And not, then you might be in a situation when you will have to explain that you are not interested in being uh, in a long-term uh, friendly relationship with this person. It might happen, but I don't think that this situation is so bad that you shouldn't give your contact in the first place. I think that if you really want to be in touch, if you're interested to hear more from the person, uh, I think you should give. If you're not comfortable doing it, you don't have to, and then you shouldn't. But I, I, I think it's okay. And for the first question, I would say that um, you're saying people have drugs on them. So I mean, we are not there as educators, uh, definitely not uh, there to tell people what to do. And for sure, people will continue use different substances even after they have difficult experience and after we supported them and it's their business, what they're doing. We're not there to actually get into people's pockets and daily life. And we're there just to purely provide harm reduction support that the person will not get hurt and not hurt anyone. Now, as far as your question about smoking a joint, I think that's a very, very important one because many people think that if they will smoke a joint, it will get the LSD to come down or the mushrooms yeah. to go. And, and, and it's many times a very bad mistake. I mean, it took me, I think, a few years of working in this field in the partisan festivals to realize that actually 90% of all the people that are visiting us also smoked spliffs during their psychedelic experience so we cannot really separate this like yeah I, I i at the moment i know how lsd is affecting in combination with 
joints or how MDMA is affecting in combination because very few people actually arrived taking only one substance. And it's true, it's the same with alcohol. People are also drinking and I, w I might ask, what did you take? And people will say yeah, one blotter of uh, LSD. And they will not say that they smoked like five big spliffs like in the last hour before and drank uh, like two glasses of whiskey. That's very important information. And if we don't ask this, people might not even mention it. They take into like, it's they take it for granted that you know, mm -hmm. or that it's just normal. Um, so I would say that I definitely do not recommend to add any other substance once someone is feeling bad. No other substance will really fix anything. And some substances like depressive medications or like uh, antipsychotics, of course, substances can have an effect and, and reduce the, the, the suffering, but it's not our role to do it. And it might become trickier because you, a person might want to smoke a spliff and you tell him, mm -hmm. I don't think you should do that. And he says, yes, I don't care what, what you I'm think, saying, I'm going yeah. to do yeah. this. <laughs> so I think this is, where the, this is where it ends. You can suggest, you can give suggestions. You, you don't need to get into arguments. It's, it's his decision. Uh, so I would say I wouldn't get into an argument about it. I would just advise and hope the person will, will listen. Thank you so much both, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, this is a difficult situation and a, and a common one. Yeah. So uh, Bob Cohen, he had a question written in. Um, how do you integrate a harsh psychedelic trip into a normal everyday life? So it's a it's a big question. Uh, I mean, there's books and articles and courses uh, and years of training that you can do it to really answer it. But I would say that the quick answer, and this is something I studied quite in, in depth. My master's thesis was around the psychedelic integration in the lives of uh, mental health professionals who use psychedelics. So I interviewed eight uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists about how they integrate their own psychedelic experiences. And there's many things that came up from it. And I would say, first of all, that there are supportive practices which are not the full answer, of course, to how you integrate the psychedelic experience, but supportive practices can be writing, journaling, um, um, painting, singing, playing music, going out in nature, uh, peer support, talking to your friends, going to therapy, uh, engaging with the symbols and archetypes that came up from your unconscious during, during the trips, all of these practices, all of these expressive practices, conscious part, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, yeah, all of these are all supportive practices for psychedelic integration, depending on who you are and what you do and what supports you. Now, a different way to approach it, I would say, is that the first stage of psychedelic integration is first of all you need to go back to a non-ordinary to an ordinary state to start the integration um, and some people it's important i think to say some people might say that the, the integration starts in the preparation okay the way i prepared myself to the experience the intentions i put uh, the the choice i had on what to take how to take do i even know what i took all of the preparation is actually a part of the integration. So I would say that the best way to integrate the psychedelic experience will start with preparing well for a psychedelic experience. But if I will talk about what to do after the trip, I will say that it starts with creating a coherent narrative of the experience. And this might sound simple, but it's not because the experience is very rich, very diverse. Sometimes we remember just parts of it. Sometimes we remember very few moments of it. And as a, someone who supports someone in the process of psychedelic integration, I help people to kind of lay on the timeline the meaningful moments that they had. What was meaningful for you in this experience, I think is the kind of core question of it. What, how, what is it in this experience that you want to bring into your daily life? What felt meaningful? What was especially challenging or scary? Yeah, what were the core moments? And then I want to kind of lay these important moments of the experience on a timeline, uh, which of course it will never contain the full experience, but it will help us kind of contain 
where it started, where it ended, what happened in, the, in between, and what is it that I'm actually left with after this experience. And then once I have this coherent narrative, we can start exploring, which is something that can take years. Uh, and, and I'm saying it in a good way. I, I don't mean that it takes years if things are going bad. I mean that from one psychedelic experience, we can get more and more and more information about who we are, how we are, who we want to be. And this is something I see lasting for many therapeutic sessions. So after we have this narrative, we can start engaging uh, with what is it that I want to bring into my life from this experience and how am I going to do it? So how am I going to do it? can be the supportive practices that will support this, but it, it might mean I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to go to sleep earlier. I'm going to, to be nicer to my family. I'm going to, yeah, uh, be, be closer to my friends. Uh, so actually implementing the insights that were gained because it's really easy to have all these deep, powerful spiritual insights and then do nothing with them. So if we did not create any long lasting change in our lives, so we had fun, but I don't think it's, it's much more than that. Uh, so I think the more we engage with what happened, the more we integrate it and we can engage with it on many different levels. And from my, my research, I saw that after this level of actually bringing specific insights and implementing them into our personal and professional life, etc., the different layers of our life, yeah, our financial life, our emotional life, our mental life. There's different layers of the experience which we can engage with as well. But then there's also us looking back at all our non-ordinary states of consciousness and, and, and asking ourselves, what, what changed? Why am I doing this? Why am I changing my state of consciousness? How, how did I benefit from it? How did I grow from it? How did I change as a person, as a therapist? Uh, so I would say that's the, the kind of tip of the iceberg, but that's what I have to say in, the, in this time frame. Yeah, I think, I think we're, we are almost actually out of time there, but that's, you know, you're talking about preparation and then continuity, uh, almost a structure to the experience. Um, and that's almost that sort of ritualistic element, if you like, the element of, of, of having a, a framework that begins before the experience and and goes many months or even years afterwards. That's the opposite of what you're getting as a as a you know running safe shore and harm reduction. People are coming yeah, to you absolutely true just in the middle and maybe would not even having thought or even known that what they're taking. So exactly those two worlds are are really <laughs> colliding there. Um, yes. Yeah, I think I think that's all we've got time for. Sadly. Um, okay. Oh, hang on. Um, although we've got, I, I wonder if we can squeeze in another couple of minutes. I think we probably <laughs> can. Um, uh, uh, Sharon, I think you've got a question. Um, um, I think we could, we could probably find, find Sharon. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sharon. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I want to ask you, talk about how to approach to someone who needs psychedelic support, how to uh, be there while they're going through it. I wonder if you can talk about um, how to and when to conclude such support. Mm, great question. Thank you. Um, I would say that we want to feel that the person, uh, first of all, is, is, is grounded, that he feels well. Yeah, even if he's not tripping anymore and he doesn't feel well, for us, he's still in the process. He's still experiencing a difficulty and we're still there to help. I will also say that we support many people who didn't even take psychedelics, but they're going through a difficult emotional experience. I'm, I'm not kicking them out of the tent because they didn't take any psychedelics, obviously. So we want to make sure that the person feels well, that he feels right, that he knows what's next. He knows how he goes back home. Sometimes we help people, especially young people, to understand how they're going to bring themselves home because they have no idea. Uh, they, they lost the people, they lost their uh, bag. They, they, we need to know that the person is really going to be safe once he steps out of our tent or the apartment or wherever we are. We want to know that the person is going into a safe surrounding. Um, that's important. We want to see 
that the person acknowledges what happened. And this is not something we can control because sometimes people just want to go home. We don't feel that they really acknowledge what happened. Sometimes I take their phone number so I can talk to them to see. And when I talk to them on the phone, they don't want to hear anything. It's their right. I, I cannot force the psychedelic integration process. But I think that we want to see, ideally, we want to see that the person is leaving the sitting session, the experience, he's leaving it with a quite clear narrative of what happened, is acknowledging that he went through something meaningful, difficult. Um, we want to see that the person just recognizes that he went through a difficult experience, that he's going to treat himself delicately, that he's not going to step out of the tent and drink half a bottle of uh, vodka now. So we kind of want to let to to end this process when first of all people feel safe and ready to be on their own that's the first one then we want to see that they feel quite well and they're back to their ordinary state of consciousness we want to see that they have the basic advices of don't take more drugs don't drink a lot of alcohol be gentle with yourself um um yes and i think in more extreme situations we will make sure that someone in their life knows to receive them well. For I will give a very short example, but we had someone who had confronted a very traumatic experience. And I knew that like his friends might not be the most uh, gentle uh, type of uh, compassionate support in, in this festival. So I made sure that the person he trusts the most out of this group will know that all of them should be gentle with him, not to laugh about him, not to humiliate him if he will cry, not to kind of make a fun out of him. This is also very important, but it's not always possible. So I would say it's kind of taking into consideration where the person is going to and seeing that he will be as safe as possible. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Sharon, for that question. Uh, sadly, we've, we've run out of time. Again, time, the old enemy is always against us. Um, but <laughs> I want to thank you, Nir. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak to us today. And a pleasure. Uh, thank you to everybody, uh, everybody who's who's joined us. Don't forget to keep in touch with us via the website. That's uplucid.org. We've got plenty of exciting plans in the pipeline. Uh, so please join the mailing list to receive some updates on uh, discounts and news about our conferences to come. Uh, we really look forward to welcoming you next time. And uh, thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.